You are listening to The Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa, the fastest clothing in the world tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner EF Education First and Canyon SRAM. Today we're in our gate. in there with some sounds from today in Harrogate where we watched the men's elite road race a little clip there finished with with Daniel Oss Daniel Oss's famous line of course which was the appropriate one for today wasn't it where are we Lionel well Richard for the final time this week we're in Betty's tea rooms Um, I've just finally had a fat rascal very nice it was too served warm a big scone Warm with butter and a lovely pot of tea. What a, what a way to round off a, a cold, damp day in Harrogate. Francois Tomazo, you're with us too? Yes, I'm here, yeah. I just had a gunpowder green tea. Uh, I don't know why it's, uh, you know, what's the difference between black and green tea? What, is one black and one green? I think you're right, yeah. It's like the yellow and the green jersey, the different <laughs> colours. Okay, well, you know, Glad to leave and learn. Up. I, feel like, I feel like Daniel Freib now being a source of that sort of information. Um, a connoisseur of teas. Uh, but Francois, Lionel, I mean, the weather has dominated today, hasn't it? We, we met Seb Piquet last night, didn't we, um, who is the, the, the voice of race radio, obviously, and calls, you know, he sits in the in the commissar's car, the race director's car, just behind the bunch. Um, and w- he was on his way for an early night because he had a very early start. But the organisers last night were preparing contingency plans because the forecast for today was so bad that there was a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C. And plan C was basically just to use the finishing circuit. Absolutely. Um, but Leeds had invested a lot in these championships. The start was due to be held there. And I woke up this morning to message from Seb saying it was plan B, which meant that we missed a couple of big climbs, but uh, still started in Leeds. We did, Richard, yeah. Well, the news was, first thing, that the course was going to be shortened by 24 kilometres, so it's down to 261. And crucially, the climbs of Buttertubs and Grinton Moor were taken out, which was disappointing for fans who were planning to head there, and I think also fans who've been there. And for uh, the people who built the temporary bridge there, because there was a bridge washed away and a, a new one built. But we saw some pictures on social media of the standing water. It was uh, well, it was it was at least ankle deep at the at the bottom of the climbs. Um, to compensate and to keep the distance up, we had nine laps of the circuit here in Harrogate instead of seven. Um, so the race, the character of the race was altered, and of course we can't really say for sure what impact that had on the race. What we can say is that with only 46 finishes, um, the lowest total since Lugano in 1996, I believe, in the World Championship Elite Men's Road Race. Won by? 
Johan Museo. Correct. I think 30 riders finished that year. I think 20 riders finished in Colombia the year before. Um, but it's pretty rare that under 50 riders would would finish um, the World Championship road race. Um, but that gives you an indication of just how grueling the conditions were. The riders were wet right from the start, and, and half the battle would have been staying um, staying warm at least. And there uh, was a, a last man standing affair, wasn't it? And uh, uh, Francois, you and I were around the, the buses as riders were, were coming back who'd maybe pulled out early and, and, and riders who'd finished the race as well. I, I've never seen riders in that state, you no, know, I shivering mean, there, violently. There was, there was one came back from, uh, uh, you know, from the course uh, rather late and usually they, they, they always always scream a little bit because to, you know, to try and ride through the crowd. But th- th- this guy, don't know who he was, uh, was really sc- screaming, you know, very violently at, at like, get, you know, let me pass because he, he was, you could, Tell it was frozen. He, he really wanted to get to the bus as quickly as possible, take a hot shower. And I was, I was, you know, I, I stood quite a while at the Colombia bus. That's the only bus with, but that had a t- TV outside. And I saw Nairo Quintana looking really, you know, in a bad way as well, watching the race from the from the coach. Actually, most of the guys who started the race this morning in Leeds ended up in the bus watching the race in, you know, on TV like 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 the rest of us. So yeah, very grueling uh, World Championships. Well, shall I summarise what happened out there on the road? There was, uh, well, there was an aggressive start to the race, wasn't there? Dan Martin of Ireland was one of the first riders to, to try to attack. He didn't really manage to force anything away. But the first break that did go clear uh, had some really big names in it. 11 riders in all, including uh, Primoz Roglic and Richard Carapaz, the winner of the uh, Welter and the Giro this year, respectively, and Naira Quintana, of course. Three Grand Tour winners in there. In the break, yeah. And there were some other strong riders in there, and they got around four minutes lead but there was never any danger that the peloton was going to let them have more than that because it it could have got out of hand very quickly once they reached the, the circuit so it was uh, it was kept in check and then was brought back under control on reaching Harrogate there was a crash the first time up the finish straight which claimed eventually claimed Philippe Gilbert Belgium's big hope for the world title Remco Evenepoel his Belgium and De Kerning Quickstep teammate waited for him and that more or less spelled the end for his race as well and as the laps went by the abandon started, Roglic pulled out Gilbert pulled out, the defending champion Alejandro Valverde pulled out and uh, well there was a there was a kind of a period where we didn't know too much about what was going on because of course we lost TV pictures because the conditions were so bad and the, the plane that was relaying the pictures from the motorbikes had to refuel and uh, we may talk about all of that a bit later on but the there wasn't a great deal of action in that period of the race anyway and fortunately we had the pictures back to see the final 70 kilometers and it really all kicked off with 67 to go when America's Lawson Craddock went. Stefan Kung of Switzerland bridged across and Kung was there at the finish. Um, but there was a bit of toing and froing as uh, the lead group uh, solidified as Kung, Mads Pedersen of Denmark, Gianni Moscon of Italy. Matteo Trentin of Italy and Matthew van der Poel of the Netherlands and the hot favourite with a lot of people van der Poel uh, they had enough of a, a gap that uh, they were looking very lively likely sorry um, from quite a long way out then the big shock of the day was that van der Poel completely blew up with 12 and a half kilometres to go Moscon who'd done a lot of work in the break cracked with around six kilometers to go and that meant that Trentin, Pedersen and Kung were guaranteed the medals more or less because the the, the group behind wasn't making any uh, inroads. Belgium were trying to close the gap unsuccessfully. Peter Sagan and maybe one or two others tried to ride across but weren't getting anywhere and so we came into the finish and if I'm a lucky man because I would have bet my house on Matteo Trentin <laughs> as they came round the final corner there at the bottom of the hill I thought he had it in the bag but he opened up his sprint possibly a bit too early 200 and something metres to go and Mads Pedersen got him before the line and had time to just glance round and put his arms in the air and become the first male men's elite world champion for Denmark uh, Trentin second, Kung third, and as I said, uh, uh, only 46 finishers. A really hard day, 
So before we discuss the ins and outs of the race, let's hear from three of the riders who came through the mix zone at the finish. Michael Matthews of Australia, Jakob Fulsang, teammate of the new world champion, of course, and finally Yorkshire's Ben Swift, who also rides for Great Britain. Oh, I was uh, horrendous. Um, yeah, not too many words <laughs> can describe um, that day. Uh, it's just one of those ones that just winds you down and uh, yeah you try and accelerate at the end and yeah have nothing I knew it was always going to be difficult um, it was always going to be a bit of a gamble of a race and uh, yeah I think with four laps to go when uh, a group of five I think went we um, we didn't have any guys there to go with it I was trying to wait for the last two to three laps before I moved and um, yeah they didn't come back we have a super strong team uh, uh, and 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 probably the strongest team we had had in a long time. But of maybe didn't have this one guy that you would say, okay, this is the favorite. But today was not about being the favorite. It was about having having balls and legs and 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 of course uh, taking the chance in in the, uh, and having a bit of luck. I have to see this one now. I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was a little bit okay. They, they, they say Van der Poel, Van der Poel, Van der Poel. He's still young and, and it's a long race and it's a tough race. And, and, and he probably also paid the price for that. Though. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if we had a world champion before in the men's. So it's, it's one of the biggest, biggest results. Uh, we have had a lot of junior world champions and, and Mass have been world champion, I think, before as a, as a junior also. But elite men is something different. I didn't, I didn't plan to get too, too drunk because there's also some Italian races coming up, but uh, this for sure going to be a party. It was a really tough day out there. Uh, pretty epic, epic weather. I think it probably looked quite cool on some of the photos and stuff like that, but it actually got really cold there as well towards the end. And you know when it's already cold like that, you know you need to start stripping off, getting ready to the finish and stuff. But uh, yeah, we gave it a good shot. So you know it was quite windy in times, and it was uh, a lot of big deep puddles out there, which made it quite quite difficult. And this climb here, this finishing circuit, sorry, was was really difficult. But the steep climb is Old Bank Road or, or something was uh, yeah that was really hard yeah I think it's perhaps the hardest one that I've done each one's been a little bit different you know Qatar was pan flat and the crosswinds in uh, pretty warm weather the thing that you had here was like really short punchy climbs which in this weather made it really difficult the fastest clothing in the world tour the home of cycling with character Ride and watch with Ratha in 2019 as they partner EF Education First and Canyon SRAM. Thank you very much to our title sponsor, Rafa, and the Rafa pop-up cafe, bar, cafe. It was a popular place to be today to watch the race. I, I went in there a couple of times, saw Tanel Kanger in there. You said, Lionel, that a lot of the riders ended up on their team buses. Tanel Kanger, who rides for EF Education First, of course, he was in there drinking his coffee, watching the race, having not obviously not finished it. Um, not, I'm not sure that he was recognised as so I'm paying for his coffee in there, but... Uh, Anyway, um, he uh, he was there. Lots of other people were there, and I spoke to the gentleman who runs the bar the rest of the year. And owns the bar, um, which is Starling. It's called Starling Bar and Restaurant, I believe. Um, and he said that it will remain have a, a link with Rafa uh, beyond the World Championships. They are going to be a sort of satellite um, branch of the Rafa clubhouses. So. Uh, all, I'm sure will remain very welcoming to cyclists and cycling fans um, but it's been a busy place and uh, there's so much to uh, unpick from today's race isn't it we as we watched it mainly indoors uh, you know, and the, the, the already from the start the, the coverage was compromised by the fact the helicopters couldn't take off so we were getting images only from the motorbikes uh, and then they disappeared as well, and it was one of those days where we thought this is this is a a race where things will happen that we don't see, and and uh, you know there could be a, a mystery to be solved at, at the end. Um, and I'm not I'm not sure that really what was the case. Um, it was a race that was very much a kind of um, 
not not so much the same as the women's race I swear there, were, there was no breakaway for the bunch to chase there was a breakaway today but it didn't get that far Lionel and Rowan Dennis of Australia on his BMC bike was uh, was very very um, kind of quite a lot of responsibility for the fact that the, the break never got beyond sort of five minutes was down to him he sat in the front for a lot of the way which um, meant the Australian team I think were confident in Michael Matthews um, but uh, um, it, it really was a race that was sort of won from the front you know and it, the riders were, were getting spat out the back throughout and in the end as you say Lionel that five man group from the front with Trenton and Van Der Poel the last two across um, was 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 how the race was in the end won I think it's it's it in the end, actually, in spite of the conditions that were terrible, uh, it was a very classic, uh, you know, circuit race. You know, you know the circuit format is, is 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 very often the same thing. It's kind of an elimination race uh, because the, the temptation for riders, well, when you 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 ride on a circuit and there were nine sur- uh, laps this time instead of of the seven they were they were scheduled in the first place, it's it's even more. It's even easier to 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 give up or to call it quits because you know every you know that at every lap you'll have a, an opportunity to call it quits. So I, I guess it's psychologically, especially at the end of the season, it you know it plays a, a part. And and it, as you said in the past, we, we've seen other world championships when when guys you know. F- uh, you know, give up one after the other, but I- even all the the, the many uh, you know kind of, kind of circuit format races I've seen is it, kind of always the same. It's it, it's you know you, you see it's it's from the front, yes, it is, but in the same it's also from the back. You you have you, have, you know every lap you know you, you have fewer and fewer riders, and and what what they were all saying today you know, that it was very it was so hard that they they. they it, each one after the other reached their limits. We saw the, the first, the, the f- to take the Eritreans. <laughs> there were three Eritrean riders in the in the, in the bunch. Uh, uh, good riders. I mean, Natal Beran, uh, uh, you know, Kudus. I mean, g- g- guys who were uh, riding the World Tour. They, they were they were out of the race before the first lap, and then gradually, let's take Julien Alaphilippe, who was among the favourites. Two laps b- before the finish, as v- Thomas Vockler uh, told me, he said, he told you know his his teammates, I can't go any further. Uh, and then you you had the, you had Mathieu van der Poel uh, in the leading group, and all of a sudden, ten k's from the finish finished no, nothing left in the tank same for Maggio Trentin we all thought of on 1k to go is 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 one you know is the fastest of the three and and he attacked I mean when you think uh, uh, what a clever tactical uh, uh, astute uh, rider is is Trentin generally I mean his attack was absolutely Terrible it was lame. It's, it's sprint, you mean? Yeah, sprint. Yeah. It, it came at the, the worst possible moment. He had, he had no stamina, no, 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 no power, no kick at all. And and and, and in the end, who won? Well, the the, the strongest guy on the day. And and as uh, Philippe Gilbert, whom I talked to and we'll listen to him later, said, well, you know, it was won by 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 a solid bulky 80 kilos guy because he, he still had you know a little bit of reserves when all the other had eaten up all they had a guy who still lives in Denmark as well and you know um, it's a bit of a cliche to say riders like that um, ride better in these conditions but it was a day where there were quite a few sort of Scandinavian you know, Alexander Kristoff was up there in in seventh a, a real a real danger man today <laughs> Peter Sagan always rides well in these conditions as well and um, Trenton does too you know I mean he won the European Road Race Championship in Glasgow um, a couple of years ago or last year sorry it went in, in, in similar conditions yeah. actually and and Mats Pedersen everybody was saying it's, it's not well it is a surprise but it's not so much of a surprise for, for the for the ones in the know because I mean lots of riders told me they expected him for since he turned pro to to do much better than he did Came second in Fla- in Tour Flanders uh, once, and, uh, and and he just won Grand Prix d'Isberg. It's not a great race, but it showed that he was he was in great shape. And and once again, he is 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 a rider uh, who, who you know who did very very well in the amateur uh, amateur ranks, and uh, and maybe comes of age just at the right time. 
Yeah, Pedersen said in the press conference afterwards that the idea was for him to go in that kind of first move in the final, which uh, you know was the was the one that was kicked off by Craddock and Kung. Craddock didn't didn't last the distance, but Stefan Kung did. Um, you said it was a kind of classic circuit race. I was left with the impression that it wasn't a classic World Championship race because it, it missed out a, a, a phase in that finale. Normally, that 65k to go move is the sort of the pre- the preamble the, the one that leads to the one that comes later but I think everyone was just so tired that That's there was right. nothing for anyone to come it, later when, when I saw Tim Wellens you know who, who, who usually relishes this kind of conditions when I saw him dropped by the main bunch as, as I thought oh well I mean the, the strongest the stronger team on paper that was Belgium you know losing Gilbert and then Wellens you know and Greg Van Avermaet my favorite at the start was ne- ne- nowhere to be seen and we saw we saw Moscon also all we saw a succession of uh, collapses. guys you know, of collapses. That's but what Denmark's we plan was that. Uh, Pedersen would go around that mark and look at, look for that kind of move knowing that Valgren and Fulsang were the ones the that could maybe mm. come later but that opportunity never came even though the gap was never too much and I think we just saw that this was a kind of a strange circuit really when you, you boil it down we didn't see quite so much of it today but from seeing it yesterday my impressions of it were that very very hard to chase on in an organised way not quite city centrey like the Glasgow one that Trentin won on uh, in the Europeans last year but but not uh, the sort of wide open world championship courses that we've seen in the past and also not with the real focal point of that set piece climb that everyone knows right that's the moment it was kind of hard all the way around in and well we saw um you know, Van der Poel's legs went at an unpredictable kind of... You thought, well, why, why has he run out of gas there? I mean, it just didn't look much on the TV. And and likewise, Moscon was just distance on that that final um, the, Yeah, climb. there weren't there weren't obvious places to attack and, and bridge mm. across. But another factor in that second, uh, you know, big attack coming from the favourites was that a lot of those favourites had lost important teammates mm-hmm. early on. So that, that group was... There weren't... There weren't enough helpers there to, yep. to to really control the pace and to set up their leaders, and so it, it, it kind of the you know I, I, there wasn't you know Belgium did quite a lot, um, but there weren't enough, and France a little bit too, but there weren't enough kind of Eve Lampert type riders there to, to the, really the drag problem it back. If you, t- if you take France, Remy Cavagna spent uh, spent uh, half the race in the front, and and two laps from the finish, Julien Lafilippe told him, "I'm." dead so they, they, they worked in a way they worked for nothing also I think some of these guys misjudged the course and uh, as you said it was very difficult uh, course to decipher uh, to, to, to read well uh, Sagan is, is an example he, he launched an attack in, in the finale the, you know in kind of chased behind the leading group but in, in the last 5k's he, he was far too late you know so um, yeah I, I think they didn't see it coming I mean it, it, it was an intriguing finale because of that. You know? I also wonder w- with the wet, you know, that makes it harder to really take advantage on the downhills and on the sweeping corners. You know, you're they're probably taking a bit more speed off, well, certainly taking a bit more speed off than they normally would, which means that then they have to spend more effort putting that speed back on when the road levels out and starts to rise again. So a real kind of, um, you know, a, a course that lay in wait and set traps for them. And, well, the two most obvious uh, uh, traps were fallen into by Van der Poel, who, have put, again, just from watching on the TV and looking at the body language, he looked so good until then suddenly he didn't. And Trentin, of the three of them, when there was a front-on shot, Kung had his mouth open and was really working hard. And we were saying, well, what's he putting all this effort in here for but I guess because he knew he had a very good chance of of getting a, a, a guaranteeing himself a medal but of the three in the front Trentin looks to have it absolutely under control and he was and lucky control. because I think uh, Pedersen as well was riding for a medal you know and I think mm. he was with two guys who especially when Moscon and it was it wasn't just Moscon being dropped but he he'd been dropped the lap before as well yeah. he was he was obviously tiring and so that helped Trenton enormously because Trenton I think what you know clearly the favorite and was saving a little bit for the sprint and was foxing a little bit on the final lap I also think in these conditions sometimes guys don't know how their bodies are going to react when 
they do you know sit up, you know stand up and, and press on the pedals and it looked to me like that's from to Trenton that when he went to make that finishing effort and you know perhaps Pedersen in particular was helped by the fact that he didn't really sit he didn't really try and play any games he, he kept oh, no. working through no I think he was the one as you know lots of guys said with the lot, lot with the guy with the most reserves I mean he still had a little bit of fuel in the tank of the finale when which was not the case for the rest we, I, I know we don't like the what ifs but still you know if if the race I mean the no, the, 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 the original you know course had been used with 24 k's more than what we got plus two climbs it, it would have made a different scenario but in terms of wearing out the, the bodies it would have been te- maybe even more dreadful than what we saw shall we hear from the victorious danish camp um, i mean mads pedersen is a rider we we don't know that well he's young he's 23 years old he was second at the tour of flanders um, i found out at the, the the danish team bus at the finish that he's coached by Andre Stenson, who is the brother-in-law of Michael Valgren, and they're both coached by Stenson, who was a pretty average professional, rode for, um, remember that team, Cult Energy? Uh, he rode for them, um, and he's also Michael Valgren's brother-in-law. He's married to Valgren's sister. Um, and uh, they're very close, Valgren and Pedersen. And, and Valgren, and I think we didn't really probably appreciate what a strong team they had, um, because Jakob Fulsang, we were talking about him, but when you consider Valgren and Pedersen were obviously in great form, that was, that was three very strong hands they had to play. And uh, Valgren got away in the end with, he, he marked Sagan and he ended up six, which is easily his best result of the season. Um, so I spoke at the finish to Anders Lund, the national coach, he used to uh, be a professional rider as well. Um, spoke to him and to Michael Valgren. Let's hear first from Anders Lund and then from Michael Valgren. Well, a historic day for Danish cycling today. You must be delighted. Um, I'm overwhelmed, uh, actually. We knew we had actually a decent chance of being in the final, uh, and also with more than one. So, and, and we knew actually that these uh, weather conditions was, was in our favour. And especially for, for Mass Peterson, he's a, he's a beast uh, under these conditions. And I think that's uh, that's why he won today. He was able to keep warm, anticipated the um, the big move from from some of the favourites, and in the end, out sprinted uh, Trentin, who was who, who was the favourite in that sprint. He went quite early on in the race. I mean, he was out there a long, long time. It was the plan for him to be an early card to play before maybe full sign out? Valgren as well was very strong in the end. Exactly, exactly. That was that was that was his way to do the final. He. He succeeded in that actually a few times, uh, also in his Berg, uh, which he won uh, not that long ago. And also he was re- came, came in close and doing the same thing a, a week or two before. So he, he he is strong when he when he gets out there and and uh, and in a final like this, when when you have a when you have the favorites coming bridging the gap, then they also then they're more equal because it's a, it's a big move they make from the bunch. So uh, and and in that situation he's just amazingly strong and uh, and I knew that uh, he would he would give Trentin a fight uh, in the sprint. Well, I was going to ask what were you thinking that final lap? I mean most people thought Trentin was a favourite, but what what were you thinking? Were you preparing to settle for maybe silver or bronze medal? I was a little bit afraid that uh, that Mass was pulling for 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 the medal, but uh, I also knew that 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 wouldn't be like him. Uh, he's a winner. And he is. Uh, he rode like he had the legs, uh, and uh, and that was my my hope that that he would he would go for the for the gold medal, and uh, and he did. We'll all get to know him a lot better over the next year as world champion. What's he like? I mean, what can you describe his personality for us? He is uh, really straightforward, um, nice guy, decent kid. He um, and then he's he's also. Uh, really professional with his stuff and uh, he he's a really um, yeah it's important for him that his bike is uh, is is ready and clean and, and well functioning and and um, and then he's a, he's, a, he's a cool kid he cracks jokes and um, and then he's also outspoken also to the to the bosses if if, if he disagrees on something but always with the uh, with respect, I yeah, that he's, he's a good kid. Uh, Gally, I mean, you and Mads are, are very good friends, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, really good friends. We've been friends for a long time, and 
you know, like we have the same manage, uh, the same manager, and we always like party every year and have the same coach. So we had a lot of mutual things uh, together. So I'm just so freaking happy for him. You'll be happy for him, but yeah. a very strong rate from yourself as well. I mean, you you marked Peter Sagan when he went and finished sixth in the end. Yeah, so that's pretty pretty all right. Like, um, I was happy I was in the final. That was my goal of goal of today. Um, and I think we did a good race, like to back off the race for for Mats. Uh, he's just so strong, you know. Like we came to the circular the first time, he almost attacked. I was like, "Oh, Mats is too early." No, no, I'm just so good, you know. Like, you know, when he's on a day like this, no, nothing can stop him. So it's just so deserved. But were you surprised to hear that he'd won when you came to finish yourself? Yeah, I was surprised because there was two Italians up there. So I thought that they like you know play the play the cards because they were like more uh, more riders in front, but. Yeah, you know, in a in a sprint, I would I would think he could beat them, and he easily did also. Because Matt is, is fast, and uh, after such a long race, he's even even faster. So, but it it, it it came as a little surprise, I must say, and I was like really emotional when I saw like Matt, Matt? yeah, wow. So that's that was really good. Ever raced in more difficult conditions than that? I don't think so. It was raining all day. Um, Super cold as well. Normally I don't really freeze, but I was I was shivering today plenty of times. I changed my rain jacket like three times, but it didn't help. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was a real men's race today. Yeah. And for yourself, I mean, you've not had the the best season and, and had a few problems. Yeah. It must be great to finish the season oh, back yeah. in this sort of form. It's it's it's, it's so good. Like I'm. I finally feel myself again, if you know what I mean. Like it's been a hard, it's been a hard, hard year. Like, I don't know really what's 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 been going wrong, but um, yeah. So it's just nice to finish off well. Shoot, uh, shoot that du peloton, cycling podcast, team car, the back of the pack, please. How would all of you listeners out there like a free case of beer from our friends at Beer 52? All you need to do is go to beer52.com slash cycling and pay the £4.95 postage and your selection of beers will be delivered to you. Well, Beer 52 are their pioneers, aren't they? Because they select, they curate beers from all over the world, um, craft beers, and they basically give you a selection to try each month, Richard. Um, when your last case arrived, what did you enjoy? Well, it's not actually the, the, the last case, Lionel, but the next case or the case that might be waiting for me when I get home because now that the World Championship cycling has finished, We've got the Rugby World Cup on, and the, the latest case from Beer 52 is called Rugby Nations, and it's dark beers selected from um, from all, from some well-known rugby nations. Uh, after and, after and, yesterday's result. And some and some less well-known rugby nations, like France, for example. Oh. And oh. The, the, <laughs> the, Ninca, the Ninkasi Brewery near Lyon. Have you heard of that, Francois? Never. Never. Well, there's a couple of beers from there, uh, 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 a kind of wheat beer and a blonde beer, Um uh, which uh, are in one of the Beer 52 selections, which uh, sound very nice indeed. So if you want to you know, enjoy the Rugby World Cup while sipping a, a beer, perhaps relevant to one of the countries you're watching, then that's what to do. I hope after the result between Ireland and Japan, if there's an Irish stout in there, that it's going to have a bit more punch than the, than the Irish team did. I'm sure it will. Ooh. I, I, as a... As a proud Irishman, that Lionel. Mm, um, absolutely. Very disappointing oh. result that was. Anyway, if you would like to have the selection of Beer 52 beers delivered to you, then go to beer52.com slash cycling and you'll get your first case of eight beers for free. Uh, if you sign up in the next two weeks, you get an extra two unmissable beers for free. That's beer52.com slash cycling. You'll also get a snack and a copy of Ferment magazine. My impression for France in the Rugby Union World Cup is that the beer will be drinking will be bitter. <laughs> <laughs> well, we heard before the break there from Anders Lund, the um, the coach of the Danish national team, and also from Michael Valgren, six the Dimension Data rider, who's had a terrible season and uh, will be pleased to finish it strongly. Uh, but the big the big shock today was Matthew van der Poel. I think I was in the Rafa shop when he had there were some members of his fan club in there and when he made his move um, with Trenton there were you know gasps of sort of anticipation this was the moment when people thought you know he was making the move that would end up with him being crowned world champion I think a lot of people 
thought that this was this was his race. And for him to make his move around 30 kilometres to go um, before any of the other big favourites did, he looked, you know, clearly very confident. And the moment when he cracked was really quite shocking, wasn't it, Lionel? We were watching that in the in the press tent, and uh, people were people were sort of stunned um, because. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, he was absolutely dominating the Tour of Britain against Matteo Trentin. But against Matteo Trentin over a much shorter distance. And um, there were some funny things about Van der Poel I noticed today. Early on in the race, he was he had a sort of grey rain jacket on, which wasn't fitted too well, it didn't look to me. It was sort of all baggy around the shoulders. And then I actually remarked to... Was it you, Richard? I, saying that he, it was almost like he was trolling the the rest of the break because he was riding along for a long time with his uh, with his gilet flapping around unzipped and flapping around and I was thinking well you know even I know that it's more aerodynamic to zip that up um, it can't have been because he was getting getting too warm surely it was cold out there but yeah that's right he, I guess it's difficult to do with cold very cold hands that's the problem for a lot I mean a yeah. lot of riders had problems with their clothing and getting overshoes off and things like that because I think their hands were so cold and then when he went pop, he really did go completely pop. And, and he finished, uh, I think, 43rd out of 46, 10 minutes 52 behind Mads Pedersen. And he lost all of that. I mean, obviously, once he'd been passed by um, the, the, the bunch there, he was just riding in. But, um, yeah, it was a, it was a spectacular um, explosion, really, or Im- implosion, rather. In a way, I mean, I've said it before, the words, you know, I, he was not among my favourites. And I, I, in a way, I'm, I'm happy... For, for for him as well that they didn't win it because everybody was saying I and mean, it's such a phenomenon and everybody has been so impressive every every time he wins a race you know he, he, he wins he wins it a la Merckx you know like boom uh, attacks when he wants and then you know and today again it, it, it looked like you know, he moved when he wanted to move. He, he was in, in in that group that you know threatening the, the, the all the others. Uh, you can tell there was some sort of a panic in the in the chasing group. You know, they couldn't make up for lost time in a group with Van der Poel, and and all of a sudden, Van der Poel is not in there a, anymore. And and so, uh, in a way, for me, it's a good thing because I, I, I had the impression, even in the interviews before the wars, that he was a little bit overconfident. You know, um, uh, Van der Poel is young, very very talented, and you had the impression. Everything was was going fine. He had never had any problem. You 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 have to suffer a little bit to know the, to know the value of victory. And today, I I, I think he, he really uh, did learn a lesson. He, he was I I talked to him in um, in the bus at the at, at the finish line, and um, well, he was actually at a loss to explain what happened. You know, he was not even sure it, it, it was fringale, as we say in French, like meaning you know a fit of hunger, uh, because actually he said in the last in last case he was feeling much better. So something happen you know he, 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 he realized that like everybody else he has his limits and I think it's good for him it's a good lesson learned well maybe we can listen to Mathieu van der Poel Mathieu you look very strong at first and uh, almost until the finale and then all of a sudden what happened I don't know uh, all of a sudden I had no strength anymore in the leg so uh, I don't think I made a mistake today I was in the right group I felt pretty good but then all of a sudden uh, the tank was empty has it happened to you in the in the past to bonk like this? <laughs> no, uh, but it's also the first time I raced this distance in the rain. Uh, we hadn't we hadn't have five k dry. I think today it was rain all day, very cold, and um, yeah, it was very hard race. Yeah, tell us about the conditions. I mean, so, so much rain. I mean, it was kind of extreme. I mean, the, the course was changed. A lot, lots of lots of things. Very extreme race. Today. Yeah, it's. Uh, World Championship, uh, I will remember for a long time. I think every rider who rode it uh, will remember it for a long time. Uh, it was extremely cold by uh, some moments. and uh, Like I said, I was in a good group. I did everything right, but uh, all of a sudden no, uh, no energy anymore. What's the feeling now? Frustration, disappointment, or oh, you <laughs> did everything you could actually? No, I did everything I could. Of course, I, I wanted more today, but um, yeah, it's not that I was close to the to the title so um, yeah it's a missed opportunity but there will come uh, more well that was Matthew van der Poel in conversation with Francois at the finish well done Francois um, I mean you know I think it's kind of unfair to, to judge him on that performance in a way and anyone, anybody because the conditions were so extreme that um, it's very hard to get everything right fueling and, and clothing in particular and if you get either of those things wrong you really suffer the consequences and, and 
he was one of the riders who I saw coming to the bus at the end who looked in the most distress. I mean, he was shaking really quite in quite an extreme way, you know, and, and he was one of those guys who I thought, you know, he's going to fall ill after this. This has been a... Um, his body's been exposed to the, the elements here and, and he uh, you know like you mentioned about the, the gilet Lionel that could, that could be quite significant or quite telling well yeah Trentin was asked in the press conference whether he felt that it was in the pocket um, as they came around the, 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 the final corner as I thought it was and of course Trentin said well it's never in the pocket as you can see because he wasn't sitting in the middle of, of the top table in the rainbow jersey uh, but, and he did say uh, you know th- these little things um, all add up and contribute over six and a half hours he said he took his, his jacket off at the start of the last lap and maybe regretted that um, and he said it was a matter of a, of a million things today. And, yeah, those small decisions that you, you couldn't pinpoint one thing will all have contributed. But when we talk about Van der Poel, and he is a sensation, we must also recognise that um, Pedersen is almost a year younger, than, 11 months younger. Um, and, and, you know, we've not... Well, Pedersen's second place in the Tour of Flanders last year didn't get the same kind of fanfare and, uh, you know, excitement as Van der Poel's. Uh, performances this spring um, but as Pedersen said in the press conference afterwards you know he he has been playing the underdog role but uh, that's pretty much impossible for him now but it's partly a dynamic way that Van der Poel races that, course, that gets yeah. that attention and yeah. you know you talk about overconfidence Francois I think it's sometimes hard to know whether that's coming from the rider or whether it's being projected onto him by you know fans media and, and all sorts of other people there is this hype around him and um I, I think he said, you know, in your in- interview that he, there are many more world championships that he will contest. And I think he is a rider who, with, with his talents, will probably win the world title I, one day. I have a little story about it. I, I don't know if I should tell it, but yeah, I will. Uh, because it's, you know, it's happened in the dressing rooms. Uh, Pauline Ferrand Prévost, uh, the, you know, the French woman who was world champion many times and was world champion uh, mountain bike again uh, this time. Uh, she, she 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 told a couple of journalists that she was uh, when she won recently she was she was waiting in the in the dressing rooms for the the doping control and 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 came Mathieu van der Poel and she 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 didn't know whether uh, you know what he was doing there and and so she asked him uh, oh so Mathieu uh, what did you do and it, he he looked at her and say what do you mean what did I do are you doubting me. Like, of course I won, you know. So that, that's what I mean. Uh, it, it, you know, the uh, guy. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I take it back. <laughs> so I mean, you know, I I think that it'll be it's 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 good for his career. Now, now he knows it from time to time. If you don't play it right, everything is not perfect. Even if you way, uh, you know, better than the rest of uh, it, it can go wrong. And it, it's I think it's great. That's the way he's learning his trade. A guy who we, you know, fancied based on his form at the well today was Philip Gilbert. And again, in a world championship, such a long race, everything has to go right. And when I saw him have a, a puncture quite early on, um, you know, back on quite easily, although <laughs> sat behind some cars to get back on, as one or two other high profile artists did, which drew a lot of comments after the disqualification a few days ago. <laughs> um, this is how riders get back on. They generally sit behind the cars. Anyway, he got back on, but even that little effort and that that disruption to his race, I thought at the time that you know you can almost sort of discount Gilbert in a way that that these little efforts, uh, uh, Julian Alaphilippe Philippe had one as well. Um, those little efforts are so important in the in the final analysis because it is like starting a the race with a, a full tank of petrol and the the challenges to use it as efficiently as possible. Well, another lesson that we learned, and, and we should know because we've been doing that for 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 a while, is is you know to try and forecast races is always a, well, a difficult, risky game, and we we ninety nine percent of the time we get it wrong, and it's probably even worse at the World Championships. I mean, we we we, we had to because we 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 were we were asked to do it, and everybody is always asking before a great uh, competition like the Worlds, who do you fancy to win? So we we all talked about uh, Mathieu Van der Poel. We talked about lots of people were the Belgian uh, the, uh, the Belgians as a team were really fancied to do well and as I said uh, 
Gilbert crashed uh, pretty badly, um, and then Remco Evenepoel. That, that was a very strange decision. Well, maybe not a strange decision, but uh, it, it was maybe uh, you know uh, a dis disputable decision to to ask Remco Evenepoel, who could have been maybe you know played a role in the finale, to wait for Gilbert. He did, uh, so that was two Belgians out of the way in a, in a sense. Then Greg Van Avermaet was my favorite. Was never never in contention. Tim Wellens was well really bad. If Lampert, uh, for, for, you know, played his usual role, which is you know setting the pace and to no effect, so it was a big disappointment by the uh, the Belgians, but and probably most of all uh, for Philippe Gilbert, and maybe the reason why Remco Ivanopoul waited for him was that he, wa he was the, de the designated uh, leader in the Belgian camp. Well, yeah, I had another thought about that, though, because I had a flashback to San Sebastian when Evnepoel waited for Alaphilippe, I think, mm -hmm. and helped him back on and then and then won the race. So, mm. uh, I, I, But G you spoke to Gilbert as yeah. well, Fish. I mean, he abandoned early, um, uh, yeah, former world champion, one of the favourites, and here he is in conversation with Francois Tomaso at the finish. Philippe, a crash early on in the race. I mean, it was very unfortunate today. Yeah, it was uh, first a uh, flat tire, and then um, uh, lately in the race um, I crashed. And uh, yeah, I don't, I still don't really understand the reason. Um, it looked like I don't know. I lost control of my bike. Uh, I didn't touch anyone. I didn't hit anything. And I just went down, and quite hard also because when, when you don't expect it, you cannot avoid anything. So it was a bad crash, and there I lost everything. So you, you looked a little bit stunned. Is there any injury or anything, or do you feel better now? I, I, it was really painful on the first moment, also because of the cold. You know, mm -hmm. when it's a shock like that and you crash, uh, you feel it uh, yeah, twice more, I think, and then also. I was trying with the help of uh, Remco Evenepoel to come back. We did everything, but at that, at that point of the race, it was full on and it was not possible to come back. Finally, the conditions, we were expecting rain, but it was bad. Oh, it was extreme. It was like uh, really, really bad. Um, some points of the race, it, we had like up some places 20, 30 centimeters uh, of water on the road. And uh, it was almost not possible to, to go by back. We had to go really slow to not crash and uh, it was also cold and uh, I, then I you know I was in the bus watching the race and we saw like a lot of guys just dropping like uh, Van der Poel, you know uh, out of energy um, this is due to the uh, the weather you don't have sometimes uh, the will or the opportunity to eat and you burn so much energy and then at one point you dropped and this is typical of this uh, this weather and the and the distance. Matt Pedersen, you young well young rider, you, you know him? I don't really know him. I, I know he was second uh, in Flanders. Uh, the year was third there behind him. And uh, yeah, that 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 day he all, also did a, a great number. And since then he was a bit searching his road, I think. And uh, but last week he came back with a nice win in Eisberg. And today, a uh, really nice win for him. So he's an expert, I think, of this kind of weather. So I, I think it's uh, you have to admit that some days it's like typical from some kind of riders. And uh, if it was like 25 degrees, you would have seen like uh, a skinny guy of 60 kilo winning. And today was like a guy of almost 80 kilo winning, you know, because the risk is better to the this weather. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport. Fueled by science. Thank you very much to Science in Sport for their support of the Cycling Podcast. And uh, Matthew van der Poel, if you're listening, um, you can get 25% off your Science in Sport products. If you don't... <laughs> well, we don't know that that's what happened, but it looked like that, didn't it? It looked like that. Not the only rider. And... and um, Trenton was asked about it at the finish. He said maybe he just missed a gel or something. It could mm -hmm. have been as, as small as that. But if you don't want to miss a gel, then use the Science and Sport codes SISCP25 at scienceandsport.com for 25% off all your Science and Sport products. Um, so what other business? I mean, we're going to hear Francois in conversation with someone else in a moment because he was just cleaning up at the buses. The Mads Pedersen of our team. Um, but the other big favourite, or one of the other big favourites, was Juliana Philippe, wasn't he? The Frenchman. 
Yes, I, I, I waited for him on the bus and it, it, it took a, a, a very long time to come down because he was, he was taking a shower and Thomas Vaucler is now the new uh, French captain. I mean, you know, he... he uh, He started his new job as the French national coach this uh, this year. Came down and say, well, you know, you have to wait a bit because Julien is really, really knackered. So, well, you know, because uh, I was a little bit cool myself, I decided to talk to Thomas Werkler about the reason why uh, Julien Philippe didn't perform as well as he expected, and also about the conditions because that's that's what everybody was talking about. So here is what Tommy Vockler had to say. Tommy, uh, is it a dis disappointment today for Julien or the conditions were really, really too hard for everybody today? Yeah, the conditions uh, are the same for everybody, but uh, for sure Julien is disappointed. And uh, But uh, all the teams are, has worked uh, as we expect, as we say it uh, yesterday. And uh, after is uh, only physically that uh, Julien could not follow uh, Van der Poel and Trentin when they when they go. When, and so, yeah, we are disappointed, but we have no regrets on what we decided to do. The conditions today, did you see the, 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 this kind of conditions in other major championships in the past? Well, maybe in Florence in 2013, but... Uh, Right, it was pretty hard today because uh, it was raining and the, the, the distance, it's uh, about seven hours of cycling. It's really a difficult sport and today the, yeah, it's one of the hardest races of, the, of the, the previous year. We saw Mathieu van der Poel bonk completely, yeah. we saw Julian in trouble, it was really, really hard. Yeah, there is only one winner. And uh, you have a lot of guys, including Julien or Van Der Poel, for example, who, when you have these conditions, you cannot expect how your legs are going to be in 10 kilometers, for example. Disappointing day for the French, really. Remy Cavagna was doing lots of work to no overall effect in the end. Uh, quick word on the British. I mean, Ben Swift was in there until relatively late on, pretty late on, um, but was, was detached. Um, Adam Yates also looking pretty, you know, just one of those riders that just tucked away, hiding away until relatively late on, but, but, but then uh, I don't think finished. But one little quirk before we talk about the Italians who had a good day, um, um, perhaps not the perfect day, but a good day. The three men on the podium today have all won small races in the last couple of weeks. A fortnight ago, Stefan Kung won the Tour du Dubs in Brittany. And last weekend, Mads Pedersen won the Grand Prix, Grand Prix d'Isberg in uh, northern France. And Matteo Trentin won the Trofeo Matteotti in Italy. So not huge wins of, by any stretch and I'm not suggesting that those three races would in future years be uh, indicators of who's going to pull on the rainbow jersey but nevertheless an interesting little trend that uh, the, the three riders um, that, that contested the finish had all um, you know tasted victory recently um, yeah interesting and how many of them had ridden the Tour of Britain I mean Trenton obviously Va Van der Poel was there for um, a lot of the time. Did Jenny Moscon not ride the Tour of Britain as Moscon well? Moscon did ride the Tour of Britain. So quite sixth a few overall. up there, um, you know, who'd ridden the, the Tour of Britain. Uh, and and no, one who, no one was up there really who'd, who'd ridden the Vuelta, was, were they? Not really, no. Um, have to, we'd have to do a deep dive into that to find the f t first rider who'd ridden Gorka Vuelta. Gorka Izagiri in ninth. Izagiri in ninth, yeah. The Canadian race is probably also a reasonable indicator, perhaps. Um, they, they, the they usually are, but this time, you know, when you see Michael Matthews and uh, Greg Van Avermaet, were, uh, the problem with the maybe for, with the Canadian races, I, th I think that's the, that the main problem. Uh, that they're, they're the same format, but they're not in the same part of the earth, or not 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 the same weather at all. And in the same time, uh, sometimes probably the jet lag can can kind of, can can affect you know the the bodies, especially in the hard courses like that. Richard made the point, didn't you, that Valgren's had a terrible season, first season with Dimension Data, certainly uh, in contrast to how well he was riding with Astana last year. A very fair comment, but uh, it, this month has actually been pretty good for him because he was fourth at the Breton Classic and fifth at the Grand Prix in Montreal. So uh, clearly some signs I, there that he I, was returning to his best. Yeah, and I, I was asked by Yorkshire 2019 um, several weeks ago before the Canadian races for my tips 
for the world. And I've tipped Michael Valgren, I'd like to say. Now, that was based on a Bink Bank tour, actually. Just There were just signs there, little signs that he might be returning to some kind of form. And he's too good a rider just to become a bad rider. Um, and I remember at the Worlds last year, you know, he almost won. He probably might have won had there not been that very steep climb right at the end. Um, he's a really, really quality rider. And uh, I expect if he can you know, get his health and his, his, his fitness right, then he could be a real force next year. Yeah. What about the Italians then, lastly? Because they had two riders in the final five, and in that position, the pressure is on to to bring home the bacon, so to speak. But it's Denmark that's it's synonymous Danish, with bacon, it's a Danish, isn't it? Danish reference there, Lionel. Oh, yeah, well, there we go. It just all joins there's up. There's a makings of a joke in there somewhere. There is. If anyone wants to join the docks, they, they can they can do so. But Moscon and Trentin, they they really worked well together, didn't they? They Moscon did a lot of work for Trentin and, and, and allowed Trentin to have a relatively easy Moscon ride. Moscon looked really good until yeah. it was Moscon. <laughs> well, I, if you look at that, the makings of a joke in there, Richard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a finished article. <laughs> that's been honed for hours. <laughs> but going back to the Italians, it's it's kind of their race to world championships. I mean, they they released that sort of uh, they, they they kind of you know up always up their game when uh, when the national you know the jersey uh, is at stake and 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 one of the you know how could I say a, a, a guy really relishes this this sort of event. He was a European champion in the past. Is Matteo Trentin? I mean, he is the, the kind of guy who, who who is always very good. Well, today, unfortunately for him, he, he was beaten. But once again, he is always good in the, in the, the, this sort of uh, of formats and and always good when when yeah, he's, he's, he's riding for his country. And and, and Italy have, have always set the pace. You know, it's 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 very common in world championships throughout the Olympics to to see the the, the Italians having a very uh, you know uh, clear strategy on who's doing. What at what stage in the race? I mean, uh, as uh, Daniel uh, told us before, you know, they, they kind of discuss the the, the strategy the, the the night before in some pizzeria or some Thai restaurant. I don't know. Pizza Hut. <laughs> and yet they they're on a terrible run. Eleven years without a, a rainbow jersey in the men's That's elite right. road race. Mm-hmm. And Trentin's silver medal there is the first time they've had anyone on the podium since Balan and Cunigo got gold and silver in Varese in two thousand and eight. I wouldn't be surprised if that eleven year drought is the longest gap between Italian men's elite road race champions. And in fact, looking at the records, I think it probably is. Certainly till going back to the, you know, the, the period after the Second World War. Well, chaps, um, our week in Harrogate is almost at an end, isn't it? Um, our week in Betty is since almost at an end. Um, what, have your, what have been your impressions, Francois, your first world championship in 30 years? Have you enjoyed it? Oh yeah, I, I really did enjoy it. It's uh, I, I like uh, well, I, as I said before, I like the, the format. I, I like the fact that it's all in the same place. I like the fact that you know uh, circuit races, you know, the laps mean it, for the public. It, it's 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 a great you know it's a great festival. It's a great party because you could see the riders pass once, twice, uh, many times. And and I think there should be more races of this format in in the World Tour uh, calendar because it's spectacular. It, it it puts an emphasis on the town on the on the region. It's good for the fans. It's good for the towns. It's, it's, I think it's good for cycling as well. And and it's in the end, you've always got great winners uh, who, who are a different kind of different kind of riders from uh, typically classic riders or gra- or stage race uh, uh, riders. I really, really uh, advo- have always been a strong advocate of of the, the, the type this type of format. So yeah, I loved it very much, Richard. <laughs> um, I, well, I've I've enjoyed it too. I mean, it's, I mean, today was very, on the one hand, unfortunate because the weather was not great. Yesterday was a great day for the women's race, and yeah. you you saw there the the potential. Um, Harrogate is a beautiful town, well worth a visit. There were loads of fans here, loads of international visitors. I don't know if the number of fans and visitors has, has lived up to the expectations or the predictions. It hasn't felt on the same scale as the Grand Depart in 2014 to me, really. Although, you know, out in the course there were there were huge numbers of fans, but I have to see the numbers. But um, it, it's certainly very, you know, it's had a more of an international feel to it. You always get, you know, groups of fans from Norway and Holland and, and, and these kind of countries. So that's been great. Um, the town itself is, is lovely. It's a great place to come and stay. Um, and, uh, you know, I think once the, as the dust settles, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it will have been a success in terms of, unfortunately, 
visitor numbers and and money because I've heard one or two stories about you know bit local businesses and even restaurants places like that being uh, feeling that it was a bit quiet. I went and bought a jacket, a, a slightly warmer jacket today from a a shop um, in the middle of Harrogate and I said you must be doing a roaring trade and he said no n- nothing at all actually because the town's closed off people can't really get in mm. um, so I think that's all that's often the case isn't it and you do hear stories after the event a place like Bergen who end up you know the thing costs a little bit more than they expected I don't know it's been great fun to be here but my my impression is that it, it maybe hasn't had the same impact and the same sense of uh, you know just overwhelming numbers as the Yorkshire Grand Depart in 2014 yeah I think that's fair um, I think certainly from our point of view we've had a great week though haven't we I mean our world championships bike ride and event at the world top brewery was uh, well it was sold out and, and uh, very enjoyable and our uh, event at the Royal Hall on Friday night was uh, was pretty spectacular actually um, to be a part of that um, and I would just say that you know the final weekend really despite the weather today has, has kind of kind of rescued it on the, the atmosphere front because I thought the atmosphere yesterday today was was really you know it's crackling as the race was uh, going on today was obviously you know it, it seemed when it rains all day like that it is quite difficult for people to have the stamina to stay out um, in it um, but the crowds when the racing was coming around it was the laps were frequent enough that people could could brave the elements but it does feel a little bit like it's emptying out again another little thing on the experience of being here and, and this was the case in Innsbruck last year as well and it's been it's been increasingly the case that more and more cycling brands are taking over cafes bars so and Rafa mentioned you know but Zwift as well took over a big bar and that's that's a really great thing it, it works really well for fans I think it's a place to go and watch the cycling you'll they'll have events with you meet riders and so on the the Zwift events in the evening um it, with some of the world champions have been a great uh, way for for them to get some kind of acclaim and and for fans to see them in action and it's adding to the overall sort of package, I think. And I noticed in Innsbruck last year, you know, and, and Ruler took over a bar there last year and, and, and here as well, in Ruler magazine. It's just, you know, it's just making it more of an experience for fans. More, There are more things to do than just come and watch the racing. It's a great, uh, well, it's a, it's a very interesting point because as I, as I you know, as I said before, I, I cover Alpine, ski, I've covered Alpine skiing a lot in my career. And, and it's always struck me that, that, that there's always been a very, very strong link be, between Alpine skiing and Alpine, Alpine skiing resorts when there's a World Cup or a World Championship and the brands, the ski brands, the, all the, the equipment around ski that are directly linked to the wor- to the to competitive world of, of alpine skiing it was not so much the case in cycling let's say 10 or 15 years ago like you had the pros in the in and you know around world championships you, you had the impression that the, the brands of the, the of, of the you know, uh, bikes and uh, all the equipment well you know were totally separate you had the pros and you had the amateurs and the, the two didn't Co- coexist in a way, and and here and in, in uh, and I suppose in Innsbruck as well. Well, you, you know, it's it's it's, it's getting the s- now it's the same. I mean, the fans are uh, themselves cyclists, and there, there's a real link between the two, and it's it's good for the industry and it's good for the sport. And it's a great place for them to go and meet other cycling fans as well. Uh, so that that as I say, that's been increasingly the case over the last few years, and it kind of reached its. Uh, well, it, it, it was it was a bit better here than it was in Innsbruck last year. I'm sure next year an egg will be will be the case. It'll be the case again there. Just on that, lastly, a big thank you to everyone who's come up to us in Harrogate and said hello over the course of the week. It's been quite. Um, well, it's been multiple times a day that people have have recognised me um, and said hello. Um, don't I mean, and and Richard and Francois as well. I'm not not just me, obviously. Uh, not I've, just not, me. I've not recognised you and said hello, <laughs> Lionel. Um, including one guy on our way here, James Torbett stopped us and uh, and and said hello and and complained that he hadn't been read out yet as a friend of the podcast. So thanks very much, James. We, we forgot to do that during these worlds. Well, we'll, resu- we'll, resume, we'll resume that when we're, when we're back to regular weekly podcasting. The week after next, we've got an episode of the Cycling Podcast Feminine coming, um, which focuses on the, the women's road race uh, with you, Richard, and uh, Rose Manley. And the regular podcast will be back the week after that.
It will. And uh, we've got Friends of the Podcast episodes coming as well soon. So if you want to sign up to, as a friend of the podcast, thecyclingpodcast.com. Um, also, we've got our tour coming up in November um, at the Cycling Podcast. Go to live events down the side. And we're doing events in Bristol, Cardiff, Worcester, Worcester Dublin, Belfast, Belfast London, London twice, Cambridge, Leicester, Edinburgh, Manchester, and that's it. Um, and and Francois, <laughs> Bye, guys, <laughs> Francois will be joining us for some of those events. So, uh, so if you want to come, please uh, check them out on our website. Uh, but that's all from the Harrogate World Championships, the Yorkshire World Championships. Sorry, the, the Harrogate World Championships, the Yorkshire World the, Championships in, Har- in Harrogate. In Harrogate, yeah, in Betty's, the Betty's World Championships. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Francois. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. You have been listening to The Cycling Podcast. Subscribe to our newsletter at thecyclingpodcast.com to get all the latest news and special offers delivered straight to your inbox. This episode was edited and produced by Tom Wally. Tom Wally.